everybody. Oh, well, this is KB5 MRQ Big Boy with old ham radio cat jumping around here. Yeah, she just jumped down. How are y'all doing this evening? A uh, couple things I'm going to bring up before I get into the main subject of this video. I got uh, Glenn Bianchi's pick going to put on here. He was our 900 sub winner. Glenn, thanks again for entering. Glad you enjoyed the book and the speaker. Uh, going to be a couple slides on here about upcoming ham fest, Monroe, is actually next weekend, Monroe, Louisiana, and uh, Shreveport coming up uh, in August. I'm, I can't make Monroe, but I'm certainly planning to try to make Shreveport. Field day coming up, gonna have some videos on that. Uh, Chris Harrell sent me some good information on several things. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a power, another power supply video next. But tonight, I will give y'all my take on the impending or not impending anymore is in effect rf exposure rule that the uh, fcc has put on us um let me clarify a couple things i'm not making light of rf exposure at all uh as ham radio operators and we've studied antennas and how to build antennas and how our stations work we are already well aware of rf exposure i really don't know why they needed a rule but got a little different take on why they did i'll go into that here in just a second but i've had when i've talked about grounding and lightning protection in the past i've had some people think that i was telling people they didn't need to ground or do lightning protection i've never told that in fact i don't try to tell anybody how to run their shack i'm just trying to give you suggestions and information so you can make your own decisions uh, this uh not going to do politics about this i'm not going to give you any snarky answers about this i'm not going to give you the nasa engineer answer david you knew i had to get that in there somehow there's all kinds of videos out there uh that former arl director i can't pronounce her name but she's got a youtube channel she's got a, a video on the whole how to calculate the rf exposure um so not going to talk about RF exposure. I'm going to talk about why I think we ended up with this rule. Now, to give you what I'm basing this on, let me re refresh some of y'all on my background and, that I've had. I've, I mentioned this in earlier videos. I'm a 23-year retired reservist. I spent first 12 years of my career, the biggest majority of it, in an infantry unit, Texas National Guard Infantry Unit where I did a lot of ground FM communications, actually ended up in operations and communications. Uh, last 11 years of my career, I did in a Red Horse, U.S. Air Force Reserve Civil Engineering Unit where I got heavily involved in again, because I had a ham license, in the ground FM communications and HF communications. We had an HF mission also. Retired as a E7, which put me in a leadership NCO status. I also worked for DOD for 37 years. And for the last three years, I was there as a supervisor over auto machining section, which put me in a supervisory status. Not bragging about being a leader or supervisor, but you'll see why I'm coming to when I talk about this rule. Working at DOD at depot level, our money was appropriated differently because we actually had to produce an item. We rebuilt vehicles for the Army. But your average government agencies that are just offices, like the FCC, they're like every government agency, including DOD, they have to go each year get their money appropriated from Congress. And one... They don't give money back because that means they'll get less money the next year. Two, they have to justify what they're doing. Okay. Since I've been a ham since 91, this last few years, the only time I can really remember the FCC doing much. One, we got the $35 license fee now. Two, and now we got the RF exposure rule. All right. 
let me try to word this right where it'll make sense. When you work in supervision, especially first level supervision for the government and senior leadership NCO, uh, NCO in the military, the government has extremely large amounts of reports and paperwork you're required to keep up with. You're not most of it's not required to be sent up the chain, but you're required to maintain it in current and keep it current. You have about a 99.9% .9 chance that nobody is ever going to ask you for this. Okay? The 0.1% chance you might get asked for it as a go in a go in the government is Something's happened, so they decide to make sure everybody has got this report. The government is really good about not using a laser and fixing the individual problem, but they'd rather put a block of explosives there and blow the whole thing up over the whole set of government rules instead of fixing the one issue. Or you'll have somebody thinking they're being fast-tracked through supervision that's coming through there trying to make a name for themselves and ask for it. The problem, if you don't have this report, got you. They got you. They can gig you. I refer to this as a gotcha report. Now, I read the article on it in QST about five times, and this is why I think FCC did it this way. Near as I can tell, and somebody feel free to correct me, they don't want you to send any kind of report in. They just want you to do it. All right. We'll talk about that here in more in a minute. So that's telling me that they did this to make themselves look good, to show Congress they've done something. Because they could get up there and flower up their little demonstration and say, okay, this is what we've done. We're taking large steps for RF safety. But they're never going to tell Congress that they don't want the report sent to them. The reason they don't want you to send a report is they'd have to do something with it. They'd have to file it, which meant they'd have to put somebody doing it. They'd have to check it, make sure it's correct. And if it wasn't correct, they'd have to send it back to the person sending it and make it get correct. So, we'll make a rule that you have to do. But we don't ever want to see it. Unless we have a reason to use it against you. Therefore, got you. Alright. Now, this may be an odd way of going at this, but look at it like this. The very rare chance you have as a ham radio operator that you would ever have to interact with the FCC. Uh, where I live, I can't see me ever having a problem with the FCC. Nobody lives around me close enough that my radios could bother. The antennas, my antenna farm, you can see it from the road, but largely it's behind my house. So there's, I don't have any interaction with anybody that would have any issues with me having an antenna. The hams that live in cities with uh, nosy neighbors, neighbor that don't like the looks of the antenna on their, your house, thinking it might hurt their value. City ordinances, I don't know how much it would help in an HOA, but you know that's a whole unique animal on its own. Should you do the report? That's what I'm getting at. If by some chance the FCC ever come to your station and started for somebody complained and you show them an up-to-date RF exposure report and your license and you're operating good, more than likely three minutes you're out of your hair and they're gone. But if you happen to not have a copy of that report showing you've made an attempt at it, then that could cause you further problems. All right. Am I saying capitulate and cooperate? You know, it's sort of like getting a speeding ticket. Three minutes on the road, whether you think you're speeding or not, take the ticket, fight it in court. If you decide to fight on the side of the road, it is going to get more help to prove their point. Now, I don't agree with this rule at all. I didn't agree with the $35 license fee. Even though a 10-year license, $3.50 a year, that's not much compared to what we pay for other things with ham radio. It's kind of the point of it. What I couldn't understand in that is, what do I get out of paying $35 when I have to make a copy of my own license when y'all usually used to mail it out? 
just like this report. They passed a law that they could show that they're doing something. It was probably amateur radios turned in the barrel with the FCC. You know, they've had to deal with cell phones and everything else. It was probably just time they looked at us. Now, I think the ARRL, if they're going to have to represent us, and I'm an ARRL member, I do think they need to take a more proactive stance in trying to stop them from enacting some of these idiot rules on us. But that gets into politics, I'm not going to go there. Now, the RF exposure report. ARRL's got a handy worksheet. I did three of them on three of my antennas. And nothing I'm doing, which I knew wasn't hurting anything, is is well within specs on RF exposure, the way my station set up. And I'm willing to bet everybody's station in specs. In fact, everybody y'all all know I don't have an amp. I run a 100-watt station. I actually did... My 10 meter antenna at a kilowatt and a half just for grins, and it was still well within specs. So, if you've got your antennas in the air or far enough away from your house, if you're running a ground mounted vertical and people in your backyard know to stay away from it, you're probably all right. Now, what I did, I took the ARRL worksheet, printed it off three of them. Put my call sign and dated them, and I'm going to fold them up and stick them in the folder. And if I remember it next year about this time, I'll do another one, or I'll redate that one. But a lot of people, the reason I'm bringing this video up like this is I saw a lot of social media posts about, oh, this is the end of ham radio, and they're using this to control us, and all this having a fit over this rule. And I, I think, for the most part, it's not going to mount to anything as far as you having to deal with the FCC on anything. As amateur radio operators, we know how to run our equipment safely and uh, enjoy the hobby. I don't believe it will hurt the hobby. If we hurt the hobby, we're going to hurt it ourselves. So do whatever you can do to help a new ham. Uh, some positive things you can do in ham radio to get people involved in it, try to help our new ham, anything you can do. Uh, Chris sent me a link uh, I'm going to put on here about the uh, moon mission. may have astronauts on it. They can use ham radio and be able to talk back. So anything positive for ham radio, let's do. This thing, don't let it get you upset. I don't think it's going to really amount to anything. Just keep your records, keep your station safe, and keep doing what you're doing. All right, y'all remember Main Trading Company? He's got a ton of used gear. He has more used gear any place I've ever seen. Uh, a couple of slides on here about the upcoming Ham Fest. We're at 905 subscribers. Y'all, I appreciate it. And as long as y'all enjoy listening to me, I'm going to keep doing this. Me and old Ham Radio Cat have a good time talking to y'all. This is KB5MIQ, Big Boy, 73.